Welcome to Democracy Nerd, and thanks for being with us. The book today, Let Them Eat Tweets, How the Right Rules in an Age of Extreme Inequality. With us are Jacob Hacker, a professor of political science, director of the Institution for Social and Policy Studies at Yale. It's a very fancy school. Paul Pearson is a professor of political science, a holder of the John Gross Endowed Chair of Political Science at the University of California, Berkeley. A very fancy school that's more affordable if you pay in-state tuition. Right now, let's just welcome him. Jacob, welcome. Thanks so much for having me. You are also have some Oregon roots that we started talking before we had our mildly formal introduction. So I appreciate that as a jingoist homer. <laughs> yeah, both Paul and I grew up in Eugene, Oregon, and uh, I went to high school in Portland. Go Ducks. And you were uh, you went to Lincoln. You were uh, you were a cardinal, perhaps. Yeah, I was a cardinal. Um, Paul, I, I'd say that with re- I say that with resignation because I was not that into organized sports, so I don't know if I went to too many games. Well, that's fair. What was what was your experience like at Lincoln? You, I, for listeners who don't care, I went to Grant, which is sort of a Lincoln rival. Though the two schools, the, although yeah. my school is much more was much more sort of you know sort of in the not as rich part of town, it's not the downtown high school, but it. Uh, but we did. We were the other school that participated in like the Constitution and the mock trial kind of crap. Yeah. What what yeah. kind of stuff did you engage in in high school? Well, I was actually a big cyclist, my, but I would say the big thing about my high school experience is that I met my, my wife in high school. Um, and, uh, yeah, we got married, not in high school after college, but, um, but she was very much into all those activities. I was much more into riding my bike and going out with my wife. So, and Paul, welcome to you. You're in, are you in Berkeley at this moment? I am smoky Berkeley. Are you having classes there? Are people going to class? Are they living in dorms? Is it all done by Zoom? Uh, the, the classes are all remote. Yeah. Um, so I'm teaching a big introduction to American politics class with 200 plus students, but it's all being done online. Uh, and um, some students are in the dorms. They allowed some students to come, but um, I would say the majority of them are, are not on campus. And you're Eugene Roosevelt Rough Rider. You also have roots in Eugene, Oregon. That's right. Um, that's right. And um, and connect, long connections to Portland, too. I, my grandparents lived in Portland, so I spent a lot of time there when I was a kid, when it was a very different city. Well, thanks for being with us. And I'll say I am currently uh, currently enrolled, as of about a week ago, I'm a currently enrolled Cal Berkeley student taking a class on, of all things, clinical trials. So there you go. That's great. Well, welcome. I mean, I when I, uh, sorry, last uh, Oregon, California thing, Please. when I got my California driver's license, I have to say, having lived a big chunk of my life in Oregon, it kind of felt like getting a Soviet passport. Like I really, it's a very strange thing to to be located in California, but not so bad. No, I, I, I feel it. I was actually born here, lived in Southern California for years, then middle school and high school here. So I have wrestled with the California, Oregon tension. I live in that tension. Let's talk about political tension. Let's talk about one of the central dilemmas that you identified. Let's start with you, Professor Hacker, a central thesis of the book is that there is a dilemma faced by conservative governments. Why don't you explain what you describe as this dilemma? Yeah, so the, the term conservative dilemma is, a, uh, is actually one that was developed by a political scientist, uh, Daniel Ziblatt, who was studying the history of, of democracy. And he argues that throughout, throughout the history of democracy, conservative parties have really been the place where inequality and democracy come into conflict. And that's because conservative parties have historically, and, uh, and if we look at America's conservative party, the Republican Party, currently uh, closely aligned with the super wealthy. And so when inequality is growing, um, they have really strong incentives uh, to try to, to hold up, you know, to, to, to defend the, the economic elites. Uh, but in a democracy, you have to actually get votes from non-elites. And so we talk about how this dilemma has reemerged in the United States as inequality has grown so dramatically. And uh, the Republican Party has, um, in this era, we argue, uh, basically responded to this dilemma by developing a strategy for serving those at the top uh, through policy. Uh, so we call that the sort of plutocratic side of the Republican Party, but appealing to ordinary voters with um, ethno-racial and other kinds of uh, extreme appeals, and we call that the the right wing populist side uh, of the party. But the, the the important thing is they're they're not competing. They're two sides of the same 
powerful coalition that um, it has uh, until uh, recently um, been, uh, you know, in control of all three branches of our government. Um, you know, in 2016, they took the White House, the House, and the Senate, despite the fact we argue that um, in a lot of ways, what they're trying to do is deeply unpopular. So, for instance, the right wing elects somebody, let's say Ronald Reagan is their presidential candidate. He appeals to the country club Republican with tax cuts and deregulation. And he appeals to voters in the South and poor voters with a cowboy hat. And I don't know, a racial strategy and Christian conservatism. Yeah, pretty much. I, 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 in fact, that term country club Republican is used in a memo that we quote from the the. Uh, the, the famous, infamous uh, political strategist Lee Atwater, who in 1983 wrote this memo to the Reagan White House that said, this is how you're going to have to win in the South. You're going to have to appeal to the populist voters who are non-rich white voters who are concerned about racial change. Um, and you've got to figure out a way to get them on board because they're not that into free market policies. They're not that into tax cuts. But what we point out is that you know, Reagan had extreme goals, but he was operating within a party that was still pretty moderate. And it wasn't until the mid 1990s with Newt Gingrich that the Atwater strategy really bore fruit. Professor Pearson, jump in. The political unpopularity sort of make the case that if we if this was all laid out, that if the primary policy objectives of the leaders of a conservative movement were laid bare. It would be a hard thing to get to 50 percent, much less super majorities over multiple elections and be able to control over time the Supreme Court, for instance. The, does, the, does it oversimplify it, or do you think that understanding this dilemma and the way to work through it is kind of the, a key keyhole into understanding how the United States, really since the 1970s, has seen this emergence of conservative political success? Well, we do think it's key. It's and it's you know it's why we focus on the transformation of the Republican Party, which we see is really, really tightly connected, not just to the racial transformation of the country, though that's obviously important as well, but to the spectacular growth of economic inequality in the U.S. And it's worth noting just before we move on that the the explosion of inequality in the U.S. really has no international parallel. There are no other rich democracies where, um, you know, the 1% or the 10th of 1% or the 100th of 1% is pulled away from everybody else to anything like the degree that has happened in the U.S. Um, and, you know, what is really amazing, and we've been, we've been tracking this, this in our work ever since uh, George W. Bush was president, it's amazing it, is that, you know, the Republican Party just made a decision really in the 1990s and the early 2000s um, that they were going to they were going to follow the money that they were going to follow the plutocrats um, and that meant embracing policies that are extremely unpopular we have a there aren't a lot of graphs in this book we're trying to make it as accessible as we can to a general audience but we do have one graph that just looks at major pieces of legislation in the US like big pieces of legislation since 1990 um, and how well they polled uh, with the general public. Um, and by far, the two most unpopular pieces of legislation, which are, were overwhelmingly unpopular at the time that they were passed, are uh, the, the Trump tax cuts of 2017 um, and um, the health care bill, the attempt to roll back the Affordable Care Act. Jacob is putting up that slide right there. And so you can see the two very short bars at the top would show the level of popular support for those uh, pieces of legislation. Those are the two big initiatives by the Republican Congress and the Trump administration at the beginning of, of Trump's term. Unbelievably unpopular because they uh, targeted their benefits really on the top 1% of the population. So he does this early. He doesn't do this right before the election. He does this as a, what would you say, a payoff? To, these, this also overlaps with the donors that pay for the campaign, yes? Uh, which is the tail and which is the dog? From my understanding of your thesis, the country club Republican, the uh, tax cut plus get rid of health care for most, you know, for millions of Americans, that's sort of the, 
that's sort of the leading essence, uh, that's sort of the head of the snake, uh, is what I hear you saying. And then everything else is maybe theater, but it, uh, maybe that overstates it. How am I misstating it there? Well, you know, I, I think that's a good place to start, right? Because, because we do really want to emphasize the sort of top down uh, part of the story. We think so many analyses of what's been going on in American politics. You know, people go to Wisconsin to a diner or a bar and they try to understand what's in the head of the Trump voter. Uh, and that's important. It is, it's, it is really important to try to understand that. Uh, but it, but it, it leaves the impression that this is something that's bubbled up from below. And we really don't think that that's right. Um, and we do think uh, that the, the party's embrace of these economic elites and their agenda has pulled them, it creates a kind of logic um, that has pulled them towards the kinds of um, politics that we see expressed on the right in the, in the U.S. today. Um, but it would be wrong, uh, I think, to say that it's a conspiracy, you know, that, that all the rest of this is theater. We say, we say in the book, it's, it's not like plutocrats are these Bond villains hanging out in their secret lair inside a volcano somewhere who have, like plot, who have plotted this out. It's, it's more of a kind of unfolding logic, right, where Republicans, once they embrace their donor class, right, and they're explicit when they're pushing for the tax cuts, you know, a lot of them were explicit saying, we have to piss, we have to pass this bill uh, because otherwise our donors are going to cut us off. I mean, it's kind of amazing that they would, you know, say the quiet part out loud like that, that we see a lot of that in American politics right now, the quiet part uh, said out loud. Um, but they don't totally control this process, they, uh, they have moved towards a kind of politics of outrage, and we should talk about this. They've, they've uh, built alliances with what we call surrogate groups who are good at stoking outrage, like the NRA, like the Christian right, like right-wing media. Um, but once they do that, um, they do lose some control, uh, where um, the unleashing of these forces of outrage uh, has transformed the party in a way that these economic elites, even while they benefit from it, they don't totally control it. And back to you, Professor Hacker. I don't know if you read Nancy McLean's Democracy in Chains, but what her, I guess my, if somebody had asked me five years ago, sort of my understanding of what's been happening in the conservative movement, it would actually pretty well correlate and pretty well reflect uh, your central thesis and what Professor Pearson was just talking about, what Paul was just talking about, that, uh, and, and maybe even worse, how I characterized it, uh, that that you had kind of separate sides, right? You had sort of the country club, Nixonian Republican, who engages in a Southern strategy to start winning over uh, racist Dixiecrats, and that, and that combination becomes the modern conservative movement. Nancy McLean takes us further back and says, no, don't think of it as two sides. Think of it as an integrated whole, where the idea of white supremacy didn't only justify white supremacy, but also was justified and did the justifying of the argument for wealth we have now, the argument for property ownership, that the primacy of property ownership over democracy was not something that was just rigged up to do a Southern strategy. That was the essence going back to John C. Calhoun and how all this gig started. And the idea was to justify the owning of people. How do you characterize, how do you think about this sort of combination? Our brains try to simplify it, but this combination, either dueling sides or or a, or, or some sort of handshake, or maybe it's a melange or an integ integrated whole. How do you characterize this sort of mix of the conservative populist and the country club Republican? Well, I would say first it's um, it's an uneasy alliance, right? And um, and I would also say that while McLean is really astute about discussing the, the sort of the deep roots of some of these conservative ideas, that actually the Nixon era, as we point out, um, shows the extent to which it's the rise of inequality since the 1970s that that creates that really helps create the modern Republican Party because Nixon's Southern strategy, which draws on these <laughs> implicit and sometimes explicit racial appeals, isn't coupled with massive plutocracy. Right? He actually is expanding government benefits like Social Security. Um, he wants national health insurance. He just wants private employers to provide the benefits. And he, uh, you know, says and his advisors try to seek, you know, blue collar workers 
um, and court labor unions in a way that no Republicans in the 2000s were doing. Um, and so we really want to understand why it is that a party that has long had these strands, right, becomes so intensely and self-reinforcing, intensely and, um, and, and ever more intensely conservative in, a cert in this way after roughly the 1980s. And we think it has a lot to do with this the way in which inequality encourages Republicans to open this Pandora's box um, and to, to reinvigorate these longstanding uh, racial uh, appeals. And I think this can explain two things that are otherwise pretty hard to explain, right? One, it can, it, this, it, it's not a, it's not, it's an uneasy alliance because the, the plutocrats are, are, they understand that this is a Pandora's box and that some of these appeals, they don't have control over, right? Um, and it's an uneasy alliance on the other side um, among those who, uh, among the right wing media and the NRA and these other groups, because they understand, even though they're not necessarily at odds with the plutocrats on those policies, they understand that the, the, the party's kind of core economic uh, and governance priorities are not their priorities, and they have to keep pushing the party to nominate super conservative Supreme Court justices um, to get out there and to really make the case for uh, for the kind of conservative values they believe in. So it's an uneasy alliance, but it works for both sides because they both are minority interests. Um, and so as I, I think it makes two things clear. One, it makes clear how it is that a society that's becoming more tolerant is giving rise to a more and more intolerant party, right? And it also helps us understand how a society is becoming massively more unequal, nonetheless, as a party that is it, that is winning a lot and controlling a lot, um, partly because of the biases of our political institutions, despite the fact that it's pursuing policies that are making inequality worse, right? Those are two things that are really hard to explain without understanding how the Republican Party has transformed. So let's go back a step and just talk about, let's keep this with this simplified sort of understanding of the both sides. Uh, yeah. I said tax cuts, deregulation, any other you mentioned the at the dawn of Trump's terms since early in, in Donald Trump's term, your two favorite examples of I'll, we'll call it sort of the, the plutocrat, the plutocratic side uh, trying to uh, trying to gut health care and successfully uh, uh, or at least effectively significantly cutting tax cuts at the high at the higher end. Any other classic examples, best examples over the last 40 years that we should keep in mind of the plutocratic accomplishments? And maybe it maybe it is, in fact, the very wealth disparities we face. Maybe that is the very thing. But what would you say? Well, let's, so let me jump in on this. I think there are two others that that we would highlight. Um, and we think this ought really is this is a really important question, Jefferson, because, you know, people get distracted by Trump. That's part of the point of our title is um, they, they pay attention to what he waves his hands about, what he tweets about, uh, and we're much more interested in what they're actually doing. And so um, the two that, uh, that I would add to the list beyond um, the tax cuts and the, and the health care proposal, which, of course, uh, didn't succeed, though they've done whatever they could to unravel the Affordable Care Act aside from that. But the two other big ones that I would mention, one is that there's been a huge amount of deregulation that's been done through the executive branch. And the example we explore in the book is the Environmental Protection Agency, uh, which a lot of your listeners will, will know about. But the extent to which they have um, put foxes in charge of the hen house um, in um, environmental protection, where you have uh, former industry lobbyists and their allies um, just running rampant through that through that agency and other agencies involved with environmental protection is, is quite astonishing and they've done an enormous amount of damage. And then the other is, uh, is the courts, uh, where, you know, as Jacob points out, there's this, this alliance in which, um, you know, we often hear about the conservative social positions of the Supreme Court justices, uh, but their economic positions, you know, we have the most pro-corporate Supreme Court uh, that we've had in a century since before the New Deal. Uh, and, you know, that, that's a big reason why they're there. So when Mitch McConnell, uh, you know, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell says at the end of 2017, this has been the most successful year for conservatives in the last 30 years, during, you know, during the time that he's been in Washington, you know, it's not because, uh, you know, they've appointed anti-abortion judges to the court. He doesn't care about that. He cares about the plutocratic agenda and he recognizes 
that they have a, you know, that they've cemented a powerful pro-corporate, uh, pro-wealth um, majority on, on the Supreme Court. And similarly, um, Charles Koch said, you know, um, uh, around the same time, we've made more progress in the last five years than we had in the pr previous 50, right? So he was going back to the, this all started with the Tea Party and when, the, when Republicans gained control of the House uh, in 2010, but he was also recognizing, and, and we, we document this in the book, the Trump administration is full of Koch brother allies. Um, you know, Mike Pence, who has very close connections to the Koch brothers was, um, you know, we, again, we, we see him as a Christian conservative, but he's also a strong ally of reactionary plutocrats. Uh, he was put in charge of personnel for the administration and many of the key economic positions, domestic policy positions in the administration are, are full of, of Koch uh, network allies. So, um, so they've been a lot on that side. So let's go to the other side then. I know I'm being brief. Some obvious ones come to mind. We talked about the Southern strategy. You mentioned race. I brought up the Christian conservatives. The very first donor to the Christian coalition was, in fact, the Senate Republican Electoral Political Action Committee. So the suite of uh, Ralph Reed priorities, I would fit in there. Uh, Others that strike you, maybe maybe security initiatives, maybe you know, sort of anti-Soviet fervor and trying to build up the military. Maybe right now, Donald Trump uh, trying to get Fox News cameras on somebody, you know, throwing a firework in Portland, Oregon, and saying the city's on fire. Uh, what are examples that are most on your mind about that sort of illustrate what is being given to, or what are the key priorities of kind of the more conservative populist side of the equation? Yeah, so. As we put it in the book, the, the Republican strategy has rested on three R's, um, resentment, um, racialization, and rigging. Um, and we'll talk more, I'm sure, about vote rigging, the way in which they magnify the influence of their voters, right? So this is a party that manages to, to get power despite the fact it often isn't getting majority support um, nationwide. But, um, but resentment and racialization are really important, and they're both about what what sometimes called tribalism, a negative partisanship, right? Creating an identity that is um, very strong, intense, and very much opposed to some set of evil other, you know. That's actors. what I wanted to get to. Forgive my interruption, but that's what I wanted to get to. That it seems like we're past some sort of alliance or some sort of handshake or negotiated agreement. It seems now that we are in a place of conservative identity that merely that identity itself is enough to raise to sort of keep the glue together. And that's even right. just hatred of Barack Obama or Hillary Clinton or Joe Biden or just triggering that anti identity is enough without even making it clear how it's connected to national security, Christian conservatism, abortion anti-gay sentiment, whatever, or even racism, however, just the idea of being conservative or not being a liberal. Yeah. So, and I think there are two things to say about that. One is that race is really central, right? There's just a lot. If you look at Republican voters, they, of course, have increasingly come to rely on rural voters, and they've increasingly come to rely on what are sometimes called working class voters, right? Voters without a college degree. Uh, and that's a shift in the, in the Republican coalition. But the point is that they've simultaneously, as they've done that, right, they've, they've formed a kind of really powerful identity around the things that unite Republican voters. And the fact that Republican voters are relatively homogenous compared with Democratic voters has made that um, easier. So race is really central because as we become a more diverse society, right, um, the, the non-white population has, bec has become uh, you know, an easy scapegoat and specter to bring up for Republicans. So the second thing, though, here that I think is 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 quite important in thinking about the way in which this tribalism and identity works is that if you can do it well enough, it really short circuits the kind of what we would think of as the kind of model of citizenship that that we that you know that the founders had, where people would actually understand the issues and vote for candidates uh, to some extent based on where they stood uh, on those issues. If you can get people to just be like, I hate the other side, I, I would never vote for Hillary Clinton. Barack Obama is a, you know, a radical Ken Kenyan socialist and not even from the United States. If you can get people to have that kind of attitude, right, 
then you might, you can actually get them to vote for candidates who want to repeal uh, the Affordable Care Act and take away their health care, right? So that has proved to be really powerful, but it didn't happen overnight. And, and it wouldn't have happened without having the kind of supercharged um, uh, effect of the, the alliance of, of this growing wealth at the very top uh, with the Republican Party. It gives me a good segue. Yohai Bankler, uh, his book, Network Propaganda, actually makes one of the points yeah. he makes in the book is the homogeneity of the conservative movement allowing for Fox News. Right. That that uh, that the uh, strategist. Oh, why am I forgetting his name? Uh, Barry Diller, uh, who first pitched the idea of Fox News. What he noticed was there's this huge market. It didn't have to be 51 percent of the people, but it was older. It was Christian. It was white. It wasn't all urban. And if you could nail that demographic, you could have a successful cable news network if success is driven by ratings, dough, and advertisers. On the other hand, if you try to put together a coalition that includes a bunch of Latinx or Latino or black or women or urbanites or poor people or, you know, uh, uh, pointy headed professors at Berkeley and Yale, that that kind of coalition doesn't necessarily lend itself to as coherent a media demographic. Using that as the segue, how does propaganda and maybe even campaign finance? uh, My friend Kyle pointed out that, uh, that, look, this rise also coincides, the rise of the conservative uh, movement, the more successful ability to uh, solve the conservative dilemma coincided with the uh, evisceration or the, the rise of money in politics and the inability to effectively tamp that down. Ta- say more uh, about the uh, the role of propaganda and even campaign finance here. Yeah, it's great. Uh, great comment and question, Jefferson. And uh, we draw on uh, Bank- the work of Bankler and his, and his co-authors. I think that that book, Network Propaganda, is uh, super important and just just to highlight one other piece of it, it's, yeah, they decided that they could target this uh, narrower audience and, uh, and that it would be hugely profitable to do that. They were right about that. The other thing that we learned about right-wing media and working on this book that I think is really revealing is how much time, even with talk radio, before you get to the rise of Fox News, how much time these new outlets devote to attacking the mainstream media. Right. Um, you know, which is kind of a weird thing uh, for um, uh, for any kind of news ent- entity, news and quotes to do, to spend all that time attacking uh, alternative sources of information. But they really wanted to capture their audience. Right. That was so. And we can see. So. So, again, when when Donald Trump says fake news. Right. He's actually building on decades of work, preparatory work that's been done by right wing media to create an audience that will accept that message, right? That, that, and, and think about what a big element of propaganda that is, right? If you can get to the point where people, it, it creates this kind of post-truth world that Jacob was talking about, one in which you have a lot of freedom to do astonishingly unpopular things in terms of policy if your audience is, you know, is just going to dismiss um, any criticism, right, as being made up. Right. And it, and it is astonishing. We, we're witnessing that in the midst of a pandemic now. Right. Even a, a p- pandemic that other countries are managing to handle. Right. It, so it, even it, when yeah, reality is staring you in the face, um, they have a captive audience um, that um, that will follow them uh, down this tribal path. Is there no limit? And maybe this is the rhetorical question and respond with whatever you want. But it is raising the question, is there a limit to the ability of effectively done identity driven uh, propaganda? Is there a limit on its ability to influence? If somebody had said, what's the thing that might break the spell? If you take that what's happening and and using Bankler's idea, you know, sort of look look at it resembles a cult, right? It it resembles a, a uh, not only internecine, that's not the word I'm looking for, but just, well, echo chamber is a, uh, is too obvious. Well, that's what I'll say. It resembles an echo chamber. And if you depart from that echo chamber, if you ever challenge it, you just lose all your tweets. Nobody reads your stuff anymore. They go and look at something else. They realize they, they sort of vote you off the island, either with votes or just voting with their eyeballs and their lack of clicks. And if somebody had said a few years ago, well, you know what would actually make people wake up is if you actually had a president 
that denied the existence of something, I don't know, like a global pandemic and then failed to act on it. And then like a hot, let's some absurd number, let's say like 100,000 people, like, like maybe 200,000 people died. And you had this whole network that was saying, no, that stuff's not even true. And that's why he didn't even do it. And then he would try to that would that finally break the spell. I it makes me think there is no breaking of the spell. Feel free to push back on that or amplify it. But then it does beg the question, what might, what is the, what moves this beyond academic conversation, democracy, nerd, navel gazing to operational understanding of what one actually does when there is this effective of a resolution of the conservative dilemma? Well, let me, ju- let me jump in really quickly and then Paul can elaborate. Cause I, I think he has a lot of thoughts about this too. I mean, The truth is, is that for right wing media and for the NRA and the Christian right, they're not majoritarian operations, right? They do not, they're they're happy to have a small, a a small, but really, really loyal following, right? And that means that their intention with what a party needs to do to win elections and the way in which Republicans have resolved that tension uh, are twofold. One is they build a, a formidable organization that's funded by very deep pocketed interest. And, um, and they have um, rigged the game in many ways or benefited from ways in which our political system is tilted towards uh, rural voters already, right? So voter disenfranchisement efforts, extreme partisan gerrymandering and so on. So I, I mention that because there is in a democracy, a system for pushing back against people who are, who are so disconnected from reality that they impose massive amounts of harm uh, on consi- their, their own constituents. It's called elections, right? And when a party, uh, we say in the book, you know, one thing that democracy is pretty good at is telling politicians when to stop, right? And so I think if you're asking, uh, you know, what's the, what are the limiting factors here? I do think it is the, the most important, right, would be effective uh, democratic competition. And I'll give you two reasons to think that's true. One, right? There is actually a lot of criticism of Republicans by Republicans, so long as those Republicans will never face the electorate again, right? So like there is, there are ex-Republicans or there are those like Jeff Flake who got knocked out of office because they, they went against Trump. So there definitely is, there definitely is some dissension. It's just, it's certainly not happening within the elected Republican party because people are scared of primary challenges and it seems to be working, right? And the second illustration of this is I think right now, right? Donald Trump is, let, let's, let's have a counterfactual. What if Donald Trump had actually done a reasonably good job of dealing with this pandemic? We look across the world. Boris Johnson is not a, a, um, a, a public health genius, right? But he's doing a lot better in the polls because he's, he's actually done slight, you know, mo- uh, quite a bit better than Donald Trump, right? So I think, and then those who've done really well, like Angela Merkel, are doing really well. So, you know, he has not seen any bump and indeed, his his public opinion polling here right, is is right near. No, I think he'd handled this well. Bond. Honestly, he handled this well. He might have sailed to re-election, right? He might have transferred. Yeah, that's tra- what, been that able to transfer actually, his economic that, argument. I saved that, his life. That sort of that shows your point that you may have expected more of an effect, but absent this pandemic, who knows, right? He might well have sailed to re-election. The identity. So I do think the identity tribalism blinders have been slightly reduced. Got it, got it, got it. There has been impact. That perhaps there will be a, a historical reckoning for the party. Paul, do you want to add anything there? Well, I, I, I just, uh, I mean, I agree with Jefferson's origi- original comment. It is, you might have thought this would be a piece of reality that would really hit people hard. And I, I think it is striking the extent to which it has not done so. Though it has done so a little, I agree with what Jake, Jacob is saying about that. But the, you know, the other thing to emphasize about this, and maybe it does bring us to this, I think, really fundamental question about how anti-democratic, you know, both anti-democratic capital D and anti-democratic small d, uh, the American political system is becoming, uh, because um, that minority strategy, we're talking about Fox News, right? They can build a very profitable business uh, by attracting a loyal, intense following, even if it's a minority of uh, the population. Well, that's not supposed to work for a political party. Mm-hmm. And I, right, which is partly why they ha- end up uh, building these alliances with these outrage groups that are good at producing um, narrow intensity, right? That's a really important argument that we develop in the book. 
And, and we show it's, this is not the first time this has happened when countries faced a conservative dilemma. Uh, you know, this happened uh, in uh, pre-Nazi Germany um, to the, to the uh, political right um, in ways that are, you know, you look at that story now and it's quite alarming because there actually are some pretty striking parallels along these lines. But it is a, it's a strategy for generating intense support among a minority. Uh, and now you come to the 2020 election uh, and Trump, um, in spite of all the assets that he has, you know, his approval rating is in the low 40s. It seems to bounce around between 40 and 43 percent. And, you know, those numbers are not good enough to win re-election, most likely, and at least if the election is reasonably free and reasonably fair, which is why um, the biases in the system and the rigging uh, that the right is engaged and become, you know, a really critical part of the of the contemporary story. So to summarize a little bit, you get a you build this coalition, the plutocrats plus the racists. Right. Forgive that. Uh, forgive that bald descriptor. And plus others. OK. Who, uh, plus folks who have a particular uh, dream to make America have the same kind of racial and 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 gender and sex attitudes that it had in the past. Uh, maybe people who are afraid of getting robbed from something, et cetera. Uh, and then but that still might not get you enough. Right. Even after you've solved the limit of that degree, it still might not get you enough. So then you add to that a big dose of propaganda. You get yourself a vast horde of radio stations. You get yourself the uh, most effective television propaganda tool in the history of humankind. And, and that's pretty powerful. But it still doesn't quite get you to the majority of the people. So what you just said is, OK, you use the R word rigging. You then have to figure out how to wield power in a in a would be democracy without 50 percent plus one. And then I think you're talking about uh, the U.S. Senate and small states, you know, Montana versus California, for instance, or maybe Wyoming is a better example versus California. Uh, the Electoral College, of course, voter suppression or maybe worse, distrust in elections. Uh, what other the lack of any limits uh, on, on uh, campaign finance? effectively uh, other examples that people should be watching and this is why i mean heck the first word of this show is democracy that's why it's not like it's not like liberal nerd right i got my politics but ultimately i think if everybody is given a chance to weigh in trying to figure out what's best for the greatest number we'll actually come up with some decent results that's my that's my faith maybe it's a misbegotten one but continue to connect those dots between solving the conservative dilemma not only through alliances or propaganda but also through that third r rigging yeah, so I think people are really aware of the risks this year, right, with the, what's been going on with the post office and the fact that we're going to have a pandemic election. And that doesn't mean just because people are aware doesn't mean those risks aren't huge, right, even so. And you, there's no question what the strategy is, the Trump strategy is for reelection at this point. Um, he, he is going to throw up as much, uh, you know, invective about the election as possible. He's going to hope it's close enough. Um, that he can, um, you know, contest or, uh, you know, contest the electoral results and or squeak through in the electoral college despite getting a minority of the popular vote. That's kind of openly the strategy in a way that's almost never been true. And it's a deeply, anti, as Paul was saying, anti-small d democratic approach. But I would mention one other thing that I think is really fundamental and why this isn't just Trump, is that even if Republicans lose, let's say they lose both the Senate and the presidency, right? As we point out, there are they have weaponized a bunch of counter-majoritarian institutions. They have weaponized most notably the Supreme Court, right? Which is now set up both to, to protect the plutocrats, right? And business from challenges and, and cripple labor unions um, trying to challenge them and consumer groups trying to challenge them. And it's set up now to protect rules of the game that are highly favorable to Republicans. And, you know, it's just striking that Republicans have lost its, uh, the popular vote in six of the last seven presidential elections, right? Um, and they have nonetheless, is that right, Paul? Six of the last seven? Yeah. yeah. It, it always, when I say it, it seems like it can't be true. They've lost a popular vote in six of the last seven presidential elections, and yet they have a very solid majority on the Supreme Court, right? So that's the counter majoritarian institution, I think, that looms largest. But another thing is, it's not in the Constitution, but the filibuster, right? If Democrats don't get rid of the filibuster, they're not going to get 60 votes. Um, in the uh, in the in the 2020 election, so they're not going to be able to do anything 
except for the budget, right? The budget is the one thing that is exempt from the, the one big thing that's exempt from the filibuster. Um, I think it's, it's really important to understand that the systemic problems are deeper than Trump and, and deeper than just the presidential election, which, you know, is obviously should be our focus right now, but is nonetheless um, not the only threat. Yeah, you have to go back to 1988 to find a non-incumbent Republican president that won the popular vote for the presidency. I mean, it's been sort of pretty clear for a while. I got to ask, you know, you all, you all have Oregon roots and Portland roots. We're seeing this in the national conversation. Uh, we're seeing it on Fox News every night, other stations. Obviously, we're seeing it here in Portland where I am sitting right now, uh, and it, which is protests in the streets. And then, heck, Portland got named by name. In the uh, in the president's nomination speech that he gave with the White House as a as a backdrop, I am reminded that Vladimir Putin had a strategy in Ukraine and elsewhere of actually get, of, of ginning up protests that he would then quell and then make the argument that he was the only one that could protect people from the rabble the, from that sort of thing and give sort of this illusion of an unattractive debate and then provide order in it. I'm also reminded the Nazis did a pretty similar thing of stirring up trouble and then saying they were the only ones who could protect people from the communists. How should we be thinking about the uh, current manipulation of social media, the current use of protests as a tool for rhetoric and making the case as yet another way to try to solve for this conservative dilemma? Yeah, I'm, um, I sometimes now look for political wisdom to Game of Thrones, and there's a line by a character in Game of Thrones, Littlefinger, you know, the great conniver who says, um, chaos is not an abyss, chaos is a ladder, right? I mean, there are, and you can go back and find passages from Alexander Hamilton and others at the founding about the dangers of the demagogue who whips up um, chaos or the perception of chaos. Um, right, as a way to um, to mobilize support. And um, I do think that's, I mean, that's clearly on display now. There's lots of conversation about this. Obviously, Portland is, is an epicenter for this uh, right now. Uh, you know, there's, there is, I think, striking evidence to suggest that maybe, at least in terms of public opinion, this, is, this strategy is not going to work the same way uh, in 2020 as it did in 1968, um, you know, both because the country is different um, and, uh, you know, really, really extraordinarily different uh, uh, demographically. So I think the audience for those kinds of appeals is shrinking. Um, and also because Trump is the incumbent, you know, it's one thing uh, to talk about the dangers of the chaos around you when you're, uh, when you're the challenger, but it's another thing to try to do it when you're an incumbent. It's kind of a um, you know, it's, again, testing the limits of um, the, the kind of counter-reality um, uh, programming that the administration is engaged in. But I just want to flag one other piece of this. It connects back to what Jacob was talking about before, which I think is just a profoundly important um, dimension of what we're dealing with right now, which is this effort to cast cities as the enemy, right? Um, and, you know, the, the, the divide between cities and rural America or exurban America, you know, the further you get away from a major city, uh, the more Republican you become. Um, this is um, uh, this is new in American politics, really, to have that kind of sharp divide. Um, and it's both politically, you know, you know, it's very dangerous for the country, especially at a time when economic prosperity uh, depends so much on what happens in American cities, right? The, the economy has been shifting in a way where more and more economic activity is, is located in these cities. Um, but it's also a political problem because the rural areas are so heavily represented, um, overrepresented in American politics. So the Senate, which I really do think is kind of the, the counter-majoritarian stronghold now, right, uh, has always had this strong rural bias, but it didn't systematically favor one political party over the other uh, in the past the way it does now. And, you know, we are just moving further and further down a road uh, in which uh, an organized minority um, is trying to rule over a majority, um, not just to stop that majority, but to rule over them. 
So what is a pathway forward? What does break a spell? I'm reminded of William Randolph Hearst and Remember the Maine, and then a conversation I had with a local journalist who said, you know, the, even Joe Pulitzer, and the, there was a big demand for yellow journalism. And then eventually people sort of figured it out and wanted something a little bit different. And you had sort of the rise of the progressive era. And what I heard you say is, well, maybe it won't work in 2020 the same way it worked in 1968. Going after dirty hippies might have been effective then, but maybe going after protesters now or going after Black Lives Matter might not work the same way in 2020. Maybe that's demographic shifts. Maybe people are figuring it out. Maybe going after a private email server in, in 2016 is one thing. And now manipulation by social media works a little bit different, although it sure seems to work on family members that I have. What do you say, what do you suggest going forward as the, as the, I'm not going to say the panacea, I'm going to say a cure, uh, not something that sort of breaks the spell, but positive efforts going forward or historical analogs that might give us wisdom to what ends up having this counter-majoritarian force able to solve, able, able to control what's supposed to be a majoritarian country. Well, the historical wisdom, I think, comes from, and we write about this in, in the book, from the reality that not all conservative parties have uh, opened Pandora's box and taken this kind of extreme route. And um, we think in the long term, we, we really would love to have a constructive conservative party. It's going to have to be in our society if it's going to be constructive, a multiracial and more economically moderate conservative party. But we think that you need to have two parties and we you're going to have a right party and a left party. And it would and, and our political system is operated best when we've had a, a conservative party that that works within the system. Um, but, you know, it, we're, we're describing a reality in which we face really, really significant hurdles, but there is a light at the end of the tunnel, right? The light at the end of the tunnel comes because, as, as we've been discussing, right, this, this strategy is reaching its limits, especially given the shift in the demographics of the country, but also because as inequality has grown, the Republican Party has placed itself more and more and more on the side of deeply unpopular policies, right? And, um, you know, there's an old saying attributed to the economist Herb Stein that if things can't go on forever, they won't, right? But the problem, I think, is that this, the corrective mechanism, right, is going to have to be free and fair elections. And so if we can hold together our democracy and, and you know, even with its tilt uh, towards rural areas, we think that um, that that you know there could be a serious correction uh, for Republicans over the next few electoral cycles if free and fair elections are maintained, uh, and that's what makes us optimistic. But what makes us concerned is all of the counter-majoritarian uh, institutions we've been talking about, and all the ways in which free and fair elections can be undermined. Um, and I'll let Paul talk about this, but we think that one thing is neglected is that you can't just Think about this as a political problem. It is an economic problem that has to do with extreme inequality. Paul, go ahead. Well, yes, I, I, I do think that's something we want to bring this uh, really excellent conversation. Thank you, Jefferson, for all your all your thoughtful questions and probing ideas. Um, but, uh, you know, that we wrote this book because we felt like we really wanted to bring to people's attention how central economic inequality and the massive levels to which economic inequality has grown in the U.S., how central that is to the, the political turbulence and unsettling trends that we witnessed uh, has been. And so uh, we do think, you know, it's both an optimistic and, a, and, uh, and a, an optimistic story and a warning at the same time. The optimism comes from the fact that precisely because there is so much inequality, um, a progressive government could do a lot of very popular redistribution, uh, make the lives of ordinary Americans much, much better, um, uh, just, just by recapturing some of those gains that have gone to a tiny sliver at the top. Um, and, and that could, you know, that could force the Republican Party to start to moderate and adapt and also adapt to the reality of a multiracial society. Um, but if we don't deal with that problem, our, you know, our, our, our main point is that this is deeply structural, um, that, um, yes, Donald Trump um, turned the dial to 11, but he did so on a machine that was built uh, by um, a plutocratic populist alliance over decades. Um, and unless we deal with that inequality problem, 
uh, we're going to keep facing these kinds of challenges. I know we need to wrap. And we're talking, by the way, to Jacob Hacker, a professor at Yale, Paul Pearson at Berkeley. The book is Let Them Eat Tweets, How the Right Rules in an Age of Extreme Inequality. But I've got to say something about what I fear as a cycle of inequality and anti-democracy. That if you take, oh, his name of his book, The Spirit Level. As, as Ted, I didn't read the book. I saw the TED Talk on the impact of wealth inequality on nations. And how once you're a rich nation, it if you get a little bit richer or even a lot bit richer, or once you're already a rich nation, it doesn't have much impact on your stress levels, on your uh, life expectancies, on suicide rates, on, uh, on anything really that people would care about as a society. But what does make a big impact on all those things and more is if you have growing inequality. So if you buy that well-done research, or what struck me as well-done research, if you look at that, um, if you see that trend, that as inequality rises, so does stress, so does crime. And as crime rises, so does potentially the desire to, among the populace, to quell that crime. That Donald Trump saying law and order, without comment on his embrace himself of law and order, but then justifies potentially another anti-majoritarian tool, another anti-democracy tool of quelling dissent under the guise of quelling crime. Again, am I being too doomsday scenario or is there a risk of inequality, in fact, not being the thing that cures uh, this solution to the dilemma, that, not, that doesn't cure this unholy alliance, but that in fact helps spread it, helps sustain it? Well, we're very concerned. We think there's a kind of doom loop that's running through the Republican Party. As inequality has risen, the incentives for the party to undermine democracy so that it can shovel money, more money to the top, um, and its incentives to um, energize voters with outrage have increased, right? And that's the doom loop we worry about. Um, but I think it's, it's really important to remember that, in fact, you know, over this period of rising inequality, We've also seen changes that um, that could could push in the other way. For one thing, I just would note that crime has had fallen to historically low levels yep. um, and is just ticked slightly up. Um, and that that's actually a big change that's you know reflects some of the shifts in the cities and that that Paul was talking about. But more important is what we're talking that we don't think it's a viable long term strategy in a well functioning democracy to appeal to a declining. Uh, minority of voters with uh, while also systematically uh, undermining their own economic well-being right we just don't we think there are real limits to that if democracy is reinvigorated and sustained and so that's the we think that that we think that you know, if you look across rich countries there's huge differences in levels of inequality and um, and those those differences are due to government policies and to how well democracy responds to the strains that inequality creates. So we're ultimately just really big believers in small d democracy and want to argue and show that um, that our democracy is under grave threat because of extreme inequality, but also that if it can be sustained, if it can be revivified, that um, it can be a vehicle for addressing this inequality and for restoring a well-functioning. Thanks for bringing us back full circle that as we address rising inequality and try to figure out how to break a spell, the democracy itself might be the thing. And if there's advice for a candidate out there, and maybe, and maybe Professor Pearson, you want to finish this up with that, or a political strategist, or a member of the media, or somebody who's engaged in the conversation in a way that might help the arc of history bend somewhere sensibly, uh, that uh, I heard two things. One was I heard democracy is the cure, and the other thing I said, if you allow democracy to be the cure, that allows us to have a conversation of addressing inequality. Anything you'd want to sharpen or add, Professor, before you guys go to your faculty meetings? Well, I, th I think you've actually underscored it really well. And, and, and indeed, this whole conversation, I, I hope, conveys the message that this is a true crisis moment um, in the life of this country. Um, and um, that a single election is not going to, by itself, produce the kinds of transformations that are necessary to uh, create a society that 
has a stable democracy and that can spread economic opportunity broadly. Uh, and so um, it is going to be crucial that anybody in a position to influence what our government does recognize that a combination of political and economic reforms, right, um, to spread um, uh, to spread power, and by power, I mean both political power and economic power, that that is going to be essential. Um, it, it is a time um, to really recognize the scale of the crisis, the, the depth of the structural challenges, uh, and to respond appropriately. Well, I want to thank you both. Again, the book is Let the Meet Tweets. The authors are Jacob Hacker and Paul Pearson, How the Right Rules in an Age of Extreme Inequality. You've been listening, maybe watching, to Democracy Nerd. We appreciate you very much. Thank you, Jefferson. Thanks so much. It was a pleasure. Be well. Stay safe.